Hey, welcome to Symptoms of the Universe, episode 5. Uh, before we get into our main topic, I want to do a shout out to our boys, Child, Child Bite. Bite. This is the brand new album from Child Bite. It's called Negative Noise, Noise. and it's out on. Phil Anselmo's label called Housecore Records. It also ties into what we're actually our main topic. Whoa, whoa, wait, yeah. just before we do that, yeah. what I thought was cool is they were selling three different versions. Of, well, not selling. Giving, giving away free stuff. Three they, different they versions if, of this if, album. They're actually on tour in Mexico right now, but they're not going to be giving away the, free, the album for free everywhere. So don't don't get your hopes up that you're just yes. gonna get a free all one. our Mexican beers. You, it might be a couple pesos to you, but it's worth it. Pesos well spent. Well, there's a few parallels we could draw. One, singer Sean Knight is the artist for this band. Uh, their bassist is named Sean, kind of like the band. Uh, that's kind of like the band that we're about to talk to and get more into detail about. Um, if the clues didn't already give it away. White Zombie. This is called... Le uh, it came from New York. It came from New York City. Yeah, it came from New uh, came from NYC. That's what it's called. <laughs> I don't even call it by the box set name because to me, this is just a reissue of their early stuff. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that where White Zombie, they think of White Zombie as that 90s alternative metal band who came out with albums like Las Exorcisto, Devil Music Volume 1, and Astro Creep 2000, Songs of Love, Destruction, and Other Synthetic Delusions of the Electric Head. Their big hit singles like Thunder Kiss 65 and More Human Than Human. Don't realize that White Zombie started way back in 1985 as a New York noise rock art punk band. As you can tell by this early artwork, on some of these records, he, and even on the later records, he was really into Robert Crumb and Ed Roth and these sort of really psychedelic images. This is stuff that comes right out of R. Crumb uh, acid, R. Crumb's acid fantasy. Yeah, it's like psychedelic and, uh, and a bit of a circus kind of thing and a bit of a horror kind of thing. Oh, it's um, very much a horror kind of thing. Because um, Rob Zombie, before he wanted to be in a band, he wanted to be a film director. And I hope he got to do that one day. <laughs> it would be kind of a neat story if he had these ambitions in the 80s and at some point got to make a couple films. That's another thing. So, getting back to the White Zombie. First of all, they named themselves after this classic 1932 film starring Bela Lugosi. Uh, and... When, when Rob Straker and his girlfriend at that time, Sean Isult, uh, they basically, I think they saw the poster for it, and Rob, Rob goes, that's, that's what we're going to call ourselves. This was back in 19, 1985, and within, uh, I don't know, weeks, they already put together their first lineup and just began cranking out uh, music. So the first release, the first release, Gods on Voodoo Moon. This is obviously a reissue. It came out originally as a 7-inch EP and it had four tracks on it with names like Tales from the Scarecrow Men and uh, King of Souls and uh, Cat's Eye Resurrection. And they replaced members like that. So they went through, in their, in their very early stages, they went through a lot of members. The first guy was... So who's, who's on this? So this, is, this still has... This is Rob Zombie. This is back when Rob Zombie looked like Nick Cave. He looked like Nick Cave with dreadlocks. He looked like a possible member of, like, the Manson family. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. The, the, the mix of Manson. <laughs> That's Shawnee Swilt right there. And then the other two guys, I don't know which one is which, is... is uh, this dude looks kind of nervous. I <laughs> know. Uh, he's not so sure about the project he's embarked on. <laughs> yeah, Ina Kastabi was the guitarist, and the drummer's Peter Landau, but they were there for, like, one record. White Zombie. And so that leads us to the second record. Actually, the, the first LP of the box set is just the 
first two 7 inches slapped onto a 12 inch. Their second release is actually more of a single because it only has two songs on it, Pig Heaven and Slaughter the Great. Pig Heaven is, uh, I guess, an, a, a song about homage to Charles Manson. I don't know if it's appropriate to say homage. <laughs> sort of encompass like uh, like an era where they're, they're very similar sounding albums or or is there like marked stylistic changes going from like here to here what did something well, change or is this more of the same as uh, okay so that's a good question uh yes and no because on one hand you could all lump this early stuff into the the lo-fi noise rock sound but the first guitarist Ina Kostavi had more of like a Dead Kennedys kind of sound like East Bay Ray so there's a lot of like surfy type of guitar and a lot of weird little note runs second guy had more of like a kind of a straightforward bluesy sound almost like um like a Jimi Hendrix cross with blue cheer type of sound which was big on the indie scene as well if you listen to bands like a lot of wah wah then a lot of wah yeah and it's kind of like butthole surfers combining the 70s wah with like an indie sound this guy was a little bit of he, he did that a little bit but he was closer to like the the, the uh, guitarist in the birthday party uh at this point I should also mention that Rob Straker was not the Rob Straker zombie that you knew on on those major label releases. He didn't sound like a pissed off biker. No, that was uh, before we filmed this. Ed played a couple uh, of these earlier albums for me, or a couple songs from an earlier album. And I would say the most striking difference is Rob Zombie sounds. Uh, he's, he's a much he's a higher pitched vocalist, and it's a very different sound than what you're accustomed to if you came to white zombie like I did, which was, uh, you know, through the major label releases. But one thing that hasn't changed is, of course, the aesthetic. Because as you can see, Rob Straker Zombie continue, you know, draws these, um, these wonderful psychedelic type of images. The song titles, you'll recognize the same exact song titles. Gun Crazy is named after a 1949 uh, film noir gangster picture. And also, the other big thing about this is that Kurt Cobain, Thurston Moore, and Iggy Pop love this album. They, uh, this is actually one of Kurt Cobain's favorites back when it came out in 1987 on the group's tiny little label, Silent Explosion. Uh, they only made, what, I think a thousand of these, and three of those thousand ended up in the hands of Thurston Moore, Kurt Cobain, and Iggy Pop, and they loved it. Awesome. And that's pr uh, pretty much a repeat. The, the, the one difference between this... And this one, Soul Crusher, for one thing, the... The art is much different. This actually has, like, depictions of the band. It's a little more colorful. These were kind of, like, black and white. Plus, they look almost. more like a metal band in this case. Yeah. But um, it's the same principal style as the previous one, except it's a little heavier and a little sludgier. And, in fact, t to me, a lot of the riffs sound like it could be, like, Melvin's or I Hate God type riffs. Kind of very heavy, sludgy. And the same kind of dissonant, noisy type of stuff I can imagine someone putting this on and immediately taking it off the turntable and saying what the hell is that but the one big difference the one well that means it's probably pretty good then. oh yeah oh I love it that's and, like my favorite kind of music it and you can see that <laughs> clearly even in the early days clearly Rob Zombie wanted the spotlight I mean look at him he's that uh, he's bigger than everyone um but he's not even on the back well no that's the rest of the <laughs> Shawnee Sewell is you know she's that's her that's Ivan and these are typical white zombie. I mean, look at these. Rat mouth. What's uh, going on? Wait. Oh, okay. I see now. Shack of hate. Uh, diamond ass. Scum kill. He had it figured out, though. He was like, front of the album is me, really big. Back of the album, hot chick. Then they made Make Them Die Slowly. And then they performed at Club Lamour, which is a New York metal club. And uh, according to Shawnee Sewell, the metalheads liked their set and actually started a mosh pit. And that was basically their kind of ticket in. They're like, maybe we should be more of a metal band. And uh, their drummer, Ivan DePrume, is the one that showed a Metallica and Slayer. He's kind of like, uh, you know, they were all, they all listen to Butthole Surfers, Birthday Party, Flipper, all these kind of noisy, punky, post-hardcore bands. And then Ivan Dupreum gives them a take. Like, you guys need some metal. Yeah. This, and the, is, this is where you're going. <laughs> and the kid, the kid was only like, he was just out of high school too. And it's funny, he's like out of high school. 
That's 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 him right there, and he he gives him, he gives him, uh, they're in the, I think they're touring. He showed him "Ride the Lightning" by Metallica, and according to Rob Zombie, they listened to that album for like a week straight. They just could could not get that record did, out. We all did. I know. There's a lesson there. When people go to a live show, understand that you as a crowd member have a responsibility. Whatever feedback you give the artist can change the direction they go in. If we see you moving out there, that's what we're going to play more of, all right? I'm actually in a band right now, in the, and we're talking about working our set based on what our singer, who's been doing it for a little bit, has seen from crowd reaction. So uh, when you go, you're not just a spectator. You, you, get, you have a say on the direction of the art that you're watching. Is the title... Make Them Die Slowly is named after a 1981 cannibal film, also called Make Them Die Slowly, also called Let Them Die Slowly, but known most popular as Cannibal Ferox, from the director Umberto Lenzi. And it's extremely disgusting, and I don't suggest watching it if you want to stay sane. See, that's what happened to him. <laughs> In fact... My dad and my friend Jared's dad saw that we had the videotape of Make Them Die Slowly, and it said, I think, 38 scenes of brutal torture, and he said, plainly, why the hell are you watching I'm this crap? This crap. <laughs> <laughs> and that why the hell were you watching that crap, Ed? What's, I like, what's, it, what's it do for you? Because I have a sick mind. White zombie. He basically, after Make Them Die Slowly... They recruited Gene Simmons from Kiss. Yep. They got... they. Uh, He's on the back, too. So what happened was John Ricci, I guess he had carpal tunnel syndrome, so they, he, had to, he had to go, sadly. But they got this other guy. Gene Jay, Simmons. Jay, oh, not, yeah. not Gene Simmons. No, because they already had a bass player named Shawnee Soult. Unless they wanted to throw Gene Simmons on guitar, which I wouldn't be uh, too comfortable with myself. If you heard that solo album, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we, we don't talk about the Gene Simmons solo album. <laughs> and the white zombie that you know and love with the heavy crushing guitars pretty much begins here. Um, basically, Jay came to the band and he had this groove-oriented, crushing, heavy sound. Rob Zombie ditched his this nasally singing in a place with this gravel-throated, pissed-off biker metal sound, and that was it. And they, they, of course, the cover, they covered God of Thunder by Kiss, and they, uh, they have an original song called Love Razor, and they remake Disaster Blaster from the previous album, but you wouldn't even, uh, know the difference. It's just this crushing sound, and, uh... I'm sorry, this, this, the, the artwork is so captivating, that's why I keep being back here, because it, this this to me almost looks like the the like the it looks like it could be death or one of those like eighties hard rock bands. I know they've totally. You know? I mean, you can see that they were going into this. They blatantly were trying to be a metal band, but at the same time, they were introducing a lot of the sixties trashy pop culture. Rob's elements. got his like armored saint vest on, and I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they were deliberately adding a new element to metal, and basically at that point, this record is it sounds like. It's it's heavy and crushing like the Melvins or Helmet or even the first Nirvana album Bleach where the sound was just this it was lo fi but it was so thick and just earthy and just and then uh, I think that was the point where they uh what's it the guy from Geffen Records kinda saw them as sort of an in between what was happening with like the alternative and grunge on one hand and the and like I guess the Pantera type on the other hand. Yeah, a type approach, and that's where they they went to the major label, and that was that. Uh, yeah. Well, one thing is interesting I want to point out is that really White Zombie followed the trajectory of a lot of these bands like Helmet, the Melvins, Nirvana, Mud Honey, Butthole Surfers, where they went from the indie world to the major label world. The mon big difference is that unlike those other bands, White Zombie pretty much acted as if none of this previous material even existed. Yeah. They acted like um, they were an entirely new band that had just signed to a major label, and no one would have been the wiser because all of these records went out of print. Do you know how I came across White Zombie originally? I'm assuming you no. probably saw my Beavis and Butthead in no. 1993. No? No. Um, there was a PlayStation video game at the time. I was a hardcore gamer called Twisted Metal. 
I know Twisted Metal. And uh, it's a vehicular combat game that's really cool. Missiles and stuff. That like 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 uh, almost like Mad Max the game. It's really cool stuff. And Twisted Metal three. Um, I think I th- I know Dragula's on it, and I think Thunderkiss sixty five might have been on it too. What was cool about the CD, though, is in addition to being a video game, if you threw it in your CD player and started it on track two, you could play all the music and sound bites from the game. Oh, cool. So so I actually got into White Zombie and Rob Zombie through that. And then furthermore and interesting is in Twisted Metal 4, um, Rob Zombie's actually a playable character in Twisted oh, really? Metal 4. And if you beat the game with him, you get to unlock the Dragula music video. <laughs> White Zombie. Zombie. 